welcome to the Radical Candor Podcast. I'm Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and Just Work. And I'm Jason Rosoff, co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor Podcast. You know, we often get questions about what to do after you've either read Radical Candor the book or maybe you attended a workshop or a keynote. How can you actually keep this whole radically candid feedback thing going? And Maybe even more important, how do you encourage other people to do the same? So today we're going to talk about how to encourage feedback between other people. So this is the last step in the Radical Candor Order of Operations. And if you're not familiar, just to review the order of operations and how we actually practice Radical Candor, first we start by getting feedback. We've got to show that we can take it before we start dishing it out. So you get feedback, you give feedback. By the way, you give more praise than criticism. We want to focus on the good stuff. You gauge feedback. How is your feedback landing? Remember, it's measured not at your mouth as the speaker, but at the other person's ear. So you gauge feedback. And then finally, encourage feedback. And this is something we're doing throughout is encouraging feedback. But what exactly do we mean by encouraging feedback? So Kim, Tell us more. What do you think encouraging feedback means to you? How do you encourage other people to practice radical candor? It's so much easier to lead by example than it is to encourage other people's behavior. If you want to encourage feedback between people on your team or at your organization, you're going to have to create an environment in which people feel rewarded when they give real feedback, when they give each other real feedback. I don't think it's ever going to feel exactly safe or comfortable or risk-free. You need to create an environment in which the rewards outweigh the risks and in which the rewards are pretty visible. You have to be and encourage others to be emotional entrepreneurs. The rewards here are often more emotional than they are financial, although you can make them financial. For example, one of the most popular programs at Google when I worked there was a peer bonus program. And this encouraged people to give each other praise because people often feel awkward giving each other praise. But I think if, if we, if we really want to create an environment in which each of us are emotional entrepreneurs, we got to go back to step number one a little bit. So let's review for a second there. Step number one is soliciting feedback and rewarding it richly. If you skip this step, nothing you do is going to help you create a culture of feedback. Kim, can you help us understand, I love this phrase, emotional entrepreneur. Can you tell us more about what inspired you to think of that phrase? What does it mean to you? Why does it relate to feedback? Well, because I think all of us have this sort of negativity bias when we take a look at risks and rewards. And we tend to focus more on the things that go wrong. And I think that's in part because we learn from the things that go wrong. It's not necessarily always bad. But if we focus on what goes right and rewarding what goes right and making that as visible, making the things that go right as visible as the things that go wrong, then I think we will be more apt to to focus on radical candor and to be radically candid and overcome. A lot of radical candor is kind of about overcoming this awkwardness that is kind of instinctive, overcoming this, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. And learning how to recognize that it's an act of kindness and we're not going to be punished socially for offering that kindness. We're going to be rewarded for it. The other person may not, you know, it may feel a little bit bad in the moment. Imagine if you were a dentist who refused to fill people's cavities because it was going to hurt a little bit. <laughs> you know, that would not be, uh, I don't, but and being an emotional entrepreneur sounds a lot more fun than being an emotional dentist. <laughs> I Kim, know. I feel like I feel like many of your metaphors relate to dentistry. Like, is this a career you wanted? You talk about brushing and flossing, you know, I'm, dental I'm hygiene. A, I'm an advisor to askthedentist.com. Oh. I'm just a little plug for Ask the Dentist. <laughs> Awesome. Hey, Jason, can you bring in, you know, we are big fans of Amy Edmondson and her work around psychological safety. Can you bring in where psychological safety fits into this and how we can nurture psychological safety? Yeah, I, I think the measure or the hallmark of psychological safety is feeling like I can take a risk without 
the fear of sort of judgment or reprisal, that people will take my risk taking as a positive sign, a social contribution, as opposed to something that takes away from the team. And, and so this idea of creating or almost creating like currency around feedback and saying that participating in a system, even if the, you don't get it perfectly right every single time, or if it, it doesn't go exactly as planned, is more valuable to us than the default, which is not to participate at all, right? Like to step back uh, and not offer your perspective or solicit per the perspectives of others. And one of the ways uh, that Amy talks about building an environment of safety is through candor, this process of actually sharing what we actually think. It's a very, even if it wasn't feedback, just saying what's on your mind, like in an authentic way, without a filter, <laughs> like actually saying what you think is a risky activity. And it is one of the best ways if we can start to do that and not get judged at the very minimum, but as Kim said, actually reward that risk taking, it starts to feel much more safe to participate fully in a conversation or to share your perspective fully with somebody else on the team. And as Kim says, it's often a gift. It's, it's often a real, a real act of kindness. Jason, can I have you and Kim drill down a little more on the candor that you're describing and just make sure that we distinguish between what we would call radical candor or compassionate candor and obnoxious aggression, just saying, well, I'm just telling you what's on my mind. So can you help me understand how you see that? Yeah, I think that the, the really important thing to remember is something we've said often, but it's worth repeating, that it gets measured not at the speaker's mouth, but at the listener's ear if it's radical candor. And so if someone else is hurt, even if you don't think they quote unquote should be hurt, like don't should all over other people's emotions. <laughs> You've got, you, part of your job in, in succeeding at this, part of the skill you need to build in succeeding at this is in listening to other people's emotions. I mean, when we communicate, we communicate on a rational plane and on an emotional plane at the same time. And if you disregard as illegitimate all the emotional signals coming your way, you're, you're just not going to communicate very well. I would add to that that often one of the biggest differences between candor and telling it like it is, is that candor should be full of I statements. <laughs> like the, it should, you should be saying the way you see things as opposed to full of you statements, which is a lot of what happens when we shift into sort of feedback giving mode. You did this wrong you should have done something differently. And that can't help but put the person on the defensive and to feel judged. And so if your goal is to build safety around this, we want to we want to take the tactical advantage that speaking from our own perspective gives us in reducing the sort of over level, uh, level of overall emotion in the conversation. And then as Kim says, like this non-judgmental space is both is two directions. Like if you don't want to be judged when you speak, you shouldn't judge somebody else for the uh, re reaction that they have. Non-judgmental, curious exploration of what's going on in our communication is a really good way to build relationships. And the absence of it is a really good way to silence uh, communication. So I think that one of the things that you can do as an individual or that you can do as a, as a leader is to help other people learn how to respond to feedback when they get it. If you're encouraging people to give feedback and teaching people how to give people feedback, you also need to teach people how to respond to feedback. And saying thank you for the feedback is not sufficient. Uh, in fact, I think a lot of people, when they hear that, uh, actually hear, fuck you, since it's our podcast. <laughs> we can <laughs> beep. <laughs> Doesn't feel like it's in the spirit. Thank you for the beep. <laughs> we have children listening in with you. I apologize. So what do you do? What do you do when you get some feedback. If you agree with the feedback, then you fix the problem and you then go back to the person and you say, here's what I did to fix that problem. Did I overcorrect? Did I not go far enough? So you, you make your listening tangible. This is really important. When it's not enough to say thank you, you actually have to do something. Now, sometimes it'll take a long time to fix the problem. So, for example, I think I've told the story before. I was working with Russ Laraway, and he told me that I tend to interrupt him a lot. And this is when we were both at Google. 
And I knew this was true, but I also knew that it was an inveterate bad habit and I wasn't going to change it just because he told me. I've been told this before. We'll put it that way. And, uh, and breaking news, breaking news. And so what I did was I showed, I made my listening tangible by getting a big fat blue rubber band off a stock of broccoli. And in my next staff meeting, I said, you know, Russ told me that I interrupt him a lot. Thank you, Russ, for telling me. Uh, and I know it's true. And I want you all to know I'm working on it and I need your help. I want you to snap this rubber band. It was the radical bander. Maybe we'll put that on our swag store. Uh, it was the radical banner. It'll have to be orange, though. Anyway, snap the rubber band uh, if I interrupt someone. And we had the kind of relationship on that team where people felt comfortable. <laughs> In fact, they enjoyed snapping the rubber And it was really helpful. It was good Pavlovian training. It hurt. So it was immediate. <laughs> it was really quick feedback. But it was more importantly, it showed that I was listening and that if you gave me some feedback, it wasn't going to fall on deaf ears. Now, there are times. Can I just pause here, Kim? I feel I'm like. I'm going to wave a purple flag. Kim, myself. I, I, just, I just was. Ableist yeah, language. Thank that's you. what. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't going to ignore what they said. And, I, and we can leave that in. Like, we got to correct ourselves and that going on to just work. We got to wave the purple flag on the biased language. So anyway, you've got to fix the problem and ask if you went far enough. You've got to show the steps that you're taking if it's going to take a while to fix the problem. But what do you do when you disagree? This is really important because I think part of the reason that people are reluctant to ask for feedback is that they feel like they have to take it. They mm -hmm. feel like this may be another terrible analogy that you all have to, but they feel like a foie gras goose um, having feedback crammed down their throats. Uh, and that's not good. You know, you have, this is radical candor. If you disagree with the feedback, you have to be able to, di to say that you disagree. But how can you disagree without seeming like you're defensive or shut down to feedback? So there's a few things you can do. The first and most important thing is look for that area of overlap. If somebody said, if somebody gave you some feedback, you probably, you might disagree with 90% of it, but you probably don't disagree with 100% of what they said. So look for that 10% and give voice to that first, just to show that you're not shut down, to again, make your listening tangible. And then if you're, you can do it in the moment, if you're not too angry, if you're angry and feeling like you will get defensive, you can do it later. You can say, as for the rest of it, let me think about it and get back to you. And then you really have to get back to them. And you've got to offer a respectful explanation of why you disagree with the feedback. This is so important because if you can't disagree with the feedback, then it can't be a dialogue. And the whole point of this is that radical candor is a dialogue, not a monologue. Something that's coming up for me is like part of the problem is is that we don't have enough exposure or experience met, like dealing with feedback. I mean, maybe this is trivializing it, but I actually think that part of building a more equitable environment it is increasing the amount and exposure we have, like the number of reps we get, right, at giving and receiving feedback. Feedback is infrequent. It's often like one direction coming from a manager to a direct report. We can actually build sort of an emotional endurance for disagreement or like not expecting what someone might say by normalizing these conversations, right, by actually saying, by building the, the feedback muscle, you make it easier and easier to address more and more difficult issues because over time that you, you actually build endurance into your ability to see the world in a different way because you've gone through that process a number like enough times. Maybe I can be curious about this as opposed to react with fury and, and, and tears. There's like a baseline that I think most organizations would benefit from building. I think it's such a great point because we talk so much about the importance of of practice and so much of the feedback that we're working with in our radical candor workshops is around, you know, this was a delayed report or there were multiple errors in your presentation, either about sort of work product or behavior. And so Jason, to your point, you know, we talk a lot about, and Kim, you've used the word stamina, endurance, you know, sort of building that muscle so that you have a foundation 
to work with. When we do our workshops and we say, what is it about criticism that's difficult when it is vague, when I feel like it's about me personally? And so that's why we use that context observation result next step. So it's very clear. This was the context. This was the one thing that I observed in this meeting. You answered the questions accurately or you didn't answer the questions accurately rather than making a value judgment about you as a person. That point you're making, Amy, is is bi-directional. It's really important when you respond to feedback to be equally specific. Yeah, I think it's great guidance because, you know, we talk a lot about practicing how to give it and practicing how to receive it. Then there's that sort of emotional manage- management that Jason was talking about of how to manage your emotions. Maybe I do need some time <laughs> before I give my response and then to give the response in a way that is specific as well. I think that's That's a great model. Uh, I do want to throw something out there as a concept, um, which is, I know we talk about get it, give it, gauge it, encourage it, which feels somewhat linear. But what I'm hearing, I think, us talk about is that actually, is it a leap to say that instead of the order of operations, another way to think about it is encouraging feedback. We encourage feedback by getting it. We encourage feedback by giving it. We encourage feedback by gauging it. It's an ongoing process rather than sort of at the end. How does that land? I like it. It's a circle of operations. You know, I I think the more that we can adopt a growth mindset to these kinds of things, or, or as my son's baseball coach is fantastic, said, you can't do right if you don't know what you're doing wrong. And uh, I think that's such an important part of this. But there's also something that happens when power gets involved. Uh, And that's why I think, like, clean escalation is so important. Part of the idea of clean escalation is is that we want to set a norm that the normal way that we communicate uh, when it comes to individual sort of performance or skills is that we talk like the observer of uh, someone doing something wrong talks to the person who did the thing wrong, right? Like there's a one-to-one relationship. And same thing for doing things right. Like we don't want, in, in the same way that we don't want sort of criticism to like go through a game of telephone, we also don't want praise to go through a game of telephone. We want to be as specific as we can. And the best way to do that is to encourage the person who observes the behavior to talk directly to the person who did the behavior, <laughs> But the problem is that's not always the norm. Uh, your organization may not yet be at a place where that, like, that's the thing that's usually happening. And so you, you may run into situations where someone is coming to you um, and saying, I have this feedback for this other person. And then you have like, uh, uh, usually they're coming to a, a leader or, or someone in the organization. Then you have a choice to make, which is like, what do I do now? Do I try to deal with this feedback directly? Do I try to deliver this now as, as the sort of third party and clean escalation says, no, first step is like, if uh, you, you encourage the person to talk to the other person directly, part of this may be, they might say, hey, I tried to talk to the person. I I'm, I don't feel safe trying to readdress this with them. They got super defensive. And that's the point at which es- the escalation part comes in. So we've talk- been talking about clean <laughs> communication, which is like two people, the people most closely involved talking to each other. And now the escalation comes in, which is if you're a manager, you want to take it really seriously and say, okay, I understand, but you know, I wasn't there. And so I don't know exactly what happened. I think the best way for us to do this is for the three of us to have a conversation together. Um, and I'll be there as sort of an ombudsman <laughs> to try to help you to reach uh, an, an understanding uh, and make sure that we can get uh, the feedback to, to land. And this is like a super awkward, <laughs> it's a very awkward conversation to be a part of. But it's incredibly powerful because you're reinforcing the clean part of communication by making sure that the two people who are most close, directly involved, stay in that conversation. The thing that we see happen, and we actually get questions about this all the time from managers and workshops, where a manager will say, well, my boss came to me and said, I have feedback for someone on your team. Could you please deliver it? To them, or someone on another team comes to me and says, "This thing happened when we were. I was in. A, I'm in a cross-functional team with so and so. This thing happened. You know, I want. I, I would love for you to. I'm giving you this feedback so you can give it to them. So this is like happening constantly in organizations, and not necessarily for nefarious reasons, because sometimes it actually seems like that's the right thing to do. The culture and sort of way things are working make it seem like that's the right thing to do. And so it might actually seem like a radical act, if you will, to borrow a word. It might actually seem like a radical act to say, I think the three of us need to speak together in order to resolve this. But when we fail to do that, we create an environment in which it is 
100% clear and certain that it is totally fine for people to talk about one another behind one another's backs and have someone else deliver that message, which is a fantastic way to discourage any kind of direct conversation. Let alone, I mean, forget feedback. Like people won't, in what world do you feel comfortable going and having an honest conversation with somebody who you know has sort of tattled on you to your boss about something that you did wrong? Yeah. And it also, it just creates a culture, a political culture. I think nobody aspires to work in a culture that is political or almost yep. nobody. Uh, I've never met anyone who really wants that. And yet if the boss allows one person to go and complain about another person to them, and then they take action without getting that, per- you know, then the people who have the, the instincts to behave that way win. And you, yep. you're rewarding, you're rewarding bad behavior and rewarded behavior is repeated and you create a political culture. So even though you feel like you're being the empathetic leader to listen to this person gripe about their peer, all you're doing, and that, that's the one time when you as a leader really shouldn't listen. All you're doing is stirring the political pot. Uh, there's another scenario that I've gotten questions about a lot where People are working in a big organization and one person has feedback for someone on another person's team who's junior to them. And in a command and control kind of system, the the thing you're quote unquote supposed to do is go to that person's boss. And I'm just going to say that kind of hierarchical communication rules don't work. I mean, think about it. Would you rather hear it from the person who had the problem with your work directly, or would you rather them go tell your boss and your boss? Of course you'd rather hear it for the, for the person directly. It's just common sense. I, I think it's so important to establish a rule that anyone can talk to anyone in an organization. There's no hierarchy about who can talk to whom. You know, when Jason was talking about having the three people in the conversation. I'm curious, Kim, if you have feedback, your boss has feedback for your direct report. Do you have uh, an opinion on whether that should be the three of you or that should be both of you? Or is it really just dependent on who the personality is and the situation is? Well, if my boss has feedback for one of my direct reports, I would ask my boss to tell them directly if I thought my boss was not an asshole. My, if I thought my <laughs> boss would go and do it well, right, uh, in a in a in a way that wouldn't uh, upset that person. Like sometimes your job as a leader in an organization, as a middle manager in an organization, unfortunately, is to be kind of like a shit umbrella. And uh, so I wouldn't want to abandon my shit umbrella um, responsibilities <laughs> if my boss were going to be a jerk. But usually I try really hard not to work for people who are jerks. And uh, and so assuming my my boss is a reasonable person, the right thing would would be for my boss to talk directly to the person. Yeah. And I think we just need to be cautious here because I, w- one of the problems that I see is that for a lot of middle, middle managers, one of the ways that they build and maintain power is by being a gatekeeper of information, a gatekeeper of communication, which disadvan- which winds up disadvantaging their teams almost 100% of the time. And so we want to, we, I just want to be clear that I think we want people by default to assume that the right thing to do is like have those two people talk directly. And then in the exceptional case where you feel like this person is going to do a terrible job delivering this piece of feedback, maybe you want to, uh, maybe you want to step in. It, it is a, a symptom and a reinforcing mechanism of the political environments that you're talking about when middle managers become informational gatekeepers. And shit umbrellas. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of metaphors. There's foie gras. Uh, Kim, I want to make sure we talk about the, you know, what, what gets uh, rewarded, um, whether it's negative or positive. What about peer recognition to encourage feedback? So rewarding the good stuff. What are, what are some things folks can do to actually encourage feedback through, through peer recognition? Peer recognition is huge because people are reluctant to give each other positive feedback. Uh, it's surprising, uh, but I think this reluctance comes from if you're a they've done these re- research on movie critics, for example, and movie critics who pan movies are universally seen as smarter than the critics who like the movies. <laughs> but we like the movies like it's important to learn how to to say when you like the movie. One of the things I used to do when I was leading big teams is bring in 
again, I sort of feel like all these animal metaphors are dangerous, but I would bring in a killer whale. I just feel bad for the orcas. But anyway, I would bring in a stuffed killer whale. And I believe technically that's a misnomer, the killer whale. Yes. Are, yes. I'm sure there's many problems with my selection <laughs> of the stuffed orca. But anyway, I chose the stuffed orca. Also, like killer, do we really want to say you're kill like in an age of- You're killing it! Yeah, no, I don't really love it. So let's change the killer whale. Let's change it. We, br- we brought in- um, we brought in some big stuffed sign of triumph, uh, and <laughs> people would nominate each other for this stuffed triumphal, the Arc de Triomphe. It was a stuffed Arc de Triomphe, and they would nominate each other for the stuffed Arc de Triomphe. They would tell stories about things that they had, remarkable things they had seen each other do that week. The storytelling was really as big a part of it as anything, because people did unbelievably kind things, unbelievably generous things for one another every single week. And nobody ever would have heard about it if we hadn't reserved 10 minutes at the end of the all hands meeting for people to thank each other publicly. And so it was a surprisingly effective tool for getting each other in that. And then they did it more often, just sort of passing in the hallway. So building that, uh, that habit of saying what you appreciate about Uh, about your colleagues is huge. Wonderful. Well, now it's time for our Radical Candor checklist. These are tips you can use to start putting Radical Candor into practice to start encouraging feedback. And remember, it's a circle of operations. So we're constantly encouraging feedback. Tip one, walk the talk. You cannot expect other people to practice Radical Candor if you're not modeling the behavior and if you haven't created a psychologically safe environment. So be the change you want to see. Tip number two, facilitate clean escalation. We want to get the default to have the two people involved in a feedback conversation talking directly to one another. So don't let people come to you and give you feedback for somebody else. Don't let them talk behind one another's backs. Encourage people to talk directly. If they still can't resolve issues though, and you're the manager, set up a three-way conversation. With a supportive clean escalation meeting, you'll help build trust between the two parties who are directly involved and show them how sharing criticism leads to a better outcome for everyone. Tip number three, use peer recognition to celebrate and encourage praise between people on your team. If you don't love my brilliant idea of the Arc de Triomphe, uh, another simple way to do this, if your company uses Slack, you can create a hashtag kudos channel And you can use Google Docs, Office 365, uh, or other software with collaborative editing. You can easily create shared document for shout outs. There's also various tools that allow you to pay out bonuses to people, uh, peer bonuses, if you have, if you've got some deep pockets for that. And finally, for more tips, you can go to radicalcandor.com backslash resources. We've got a bunch of learning guides that will help you encourage feedback amongst your team and across your organization. If you want to find the show notes for this episode, head over to radicalcandor.com backslash podcast. If you like what you hear, uh, please do rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. And of course, don't forget to order Kim's new book with its fancy new title, Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying to create a kick-ass culture of inclusion. It is available everywhere books are sold. And finally, if you're wondering, gosh, where could I get some Radical Candor swag? And I wonder, is the Arc de Triomphe available there? Go to RadicalCandor.com, click the shop link, go ahead, get your two-by-twos and your notebooks with the Radical Candor framework, and we're going to start looking into stuffed animals as well. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at RadicalCandor.com.